welcome to the first edition of my podcast, The Claws Corner. I did have it on iTunes, but now since the pandemic, it forced me to go with Zoom, which I'm loving right now. And my first guest today is writer, actor, musician, director, producer, and special effects guru. He is also the founder of Morbid Vision Films and has released some of the best and most brutal movies. When I say brutal, that is the biggest compliment you can ever get from me. And some of those movies included Cryptic Plasm, Blood Pigs, Fetus, At Dawn They Sleep, and Dead Girl on Film. Please welcome to the show the extremely talented Brian Pollan. Brian, how are you? Good. How are you doing? I am doing very well. So let people know right now we are recording in the middle of the pandemic. It's probably yeah. day 435. I don't know what date it is. I'm losing track of time. So for you, how have you been? I'm all right. Um, unfortunately, yeah, because of this, I'm out of work. I don't I have a full-time job, but yeah, I'm out of work right now and I'm losing track of days and I don't know what day is what, but uh, it's, it's going all right. <laughs> I, know. I, I, was, I was saying in one of my other shows that I do, I said, watching these back, I feel like one of those movies where like either an avalanche happened or a cave, the rocks caved in, it's like, it's day 435. Yeah, really. I don't know if anybody knows I'm alive. I might st start gnawing on my own arm pretty soon. You can make that into a movie. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I'm glad to see you're doing well. Um, let's get right into it. You, you own Morbid Vision Films, and I mentioned some of the titles. Your movies are definitely considered extreme horror. And were you introduced at an early age to these kinds of movies? No, not at all. Really? <laughs> Actually, when I was younger, I was, I was fascinated by horror. Like when I was a kid, I was obsessed with Halloween, anything yes. supernatural. But I was, I was, very curious about horror films, but I was afraid of them when I was a kid. But I would, my, the way I got introduced was through like older cousins and stuff. They would tell me about, you know, they saw Friday 13th, Pop 4 or something oh, yeah. like that. It actually took me a while. It wasn't until I was like maybe, I don't know, 12 or 13 until I actually started watching them. Yeah, I think for me, what, I was born 68. So, you know, 73, The Exorcist came out and then Evil Dead and Halloween. So probably when I remember my father used to wake my brothers and I up around three o'clock in the morning. Back then it was the movie channel before HBO. I'd say, hey, Phantasm's on. You wanna, you know, wanna see it? So we, my brothers and I saw almost every horror movie that we shouldn't have seen, which I'm so glad we did because by the time I was 11 or 12 years old, I was so you know, used to it. There was nothing to bother me. But I mean, I, I remember seeing Evil Dead in the theater, Phantasm I saw in the movie channel, and that was probably the only movie that ever scared me. I was yeah. so, because the tall man coming after me with the uh, sphere. But I remember watching Evil Dead. I saw The Exorcist driving. It probably wasn't 73. Maybe it was a little bit, I was a little bit older than me, like 12 or 13. But I was introduced to horror movies at an early age. And it wasn't until later on I was introduced to the extreme horror, which I love. Lucio Fulci, Dario Argento. So for you, because um, I know they said we, your movies are very, very extreme, which I love. I think they would definitely be at the top of the video nasties now. <laughs> Cause you know what the video nasties are, I'm sure. Oh yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Obviously for my viewers who might not know back in the eighties, all these directors and producers were being called in the court. Like Sam Raimi was called in the court for the evil dead. He, he, they were faring jail time, but that made their movie so much more popular because everybody's like, I have to see this movie. What's so bad about it? And I think that the video nasties actually made movies more popular and more people wanted to see them because of that. So I think your movies would definitely be at the top of the list and that would be the highest compliment anybody can ever give your movies. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, all that does is give so much publicity to the movies because we had it happen to one of our films. Um, obviously, the video nasties was England, you know, way back. Yeah. But uh, we got banned in Germany. Really? And For Which well, movie? Fetus. Fetus. <laughs> Fetus. <laughs> Fetus got banned in Germany and we, got, we have received two different uh, lots of paperwork from uh, the German government saying do not send this into our country anymore. Oh my and God, how'd they, how'd they find out about it? They confiscated someone's package when they ordered it. That's they, I funny. Randomly, I, I think because Germany has a really strict policy against extreme violence in movies. Yeah. I heard it still goes from uh, World War II. They just kind of like they just don't want anything to do with that. But um, I think if they keep seeing a certain movie company entering the, com the country, they eventually, they must have been what it was. They must have just um, confiscated someone's package. They saw more vision films again on a package. So they opened it up. And of course, as soon as you see the cover of Fetus, I'm sure <laughs> that's very happy. I and love that movie. They actually, 
they actually had a court case. They had they um had a federal court case. They had the whole <laughs> whatever it is. You know, I'm not sure who exactly they are, but they all watched the movie and they deemed it inappropriate for Germany. <laughs> Did you have to go to court? I was invited. There actually was the paperwork that says you can come to the hearing. And I'm like, hell no. <laughs> I know. <laughs> you well, can't piss at me. God, it was nice of them to ask. <laughs> if yeah. you want to go to court, I would love like, to see yeah. that. <laughs> I'll go to another country and then all of a sudden, oh, by the way, all right, there's a 20 day jail period that comes with this. And I'm not leaving. Oh, I know. 20 days. So, no, <laughs> yeah, go ahead. But the thing is, um, once it got banned, it gets added to an actual federal government website. So they put the name of the movie. They actually put my name, the company name. I think they put my home address on the page as well. Oh my God. But the next day, we got flooded with orders for Titus. Perfect. I mean, that's exactly what we were talking about. Yeah, exactly. All it did was give it publicity. And I had um, a fan from Germany write to me. He's like, congratulations, you're on the government list now. <laughs> you're my hero. <laughs> the only problem was we had to figure out how to get all those orders to all those people. You know what's funny? I got to tell you a funny story that happened to me with your movie, Fetus, because yep, I yep. met you at Rock and Shock, which is yep. a, a convention, unfortunately, no longer. And I don't even know what's going to happen in the conventions now because of uh, what's going on with the pandemic, because Phantasm is doing it. They just did a virtual online um, convention, which I'm not sure how that went. I'm going to be interviewing Reggie sometime soon, hopefully, but I want to talk to him about that. But anyway, so at Rock and Shock, you had the actual fetus that was used in the movie. So I took a picture of it and I put it on my Facebook page for Father's Day. My son and I want to wish everybody a happy Father's Day. I got so many posts. It was actually taken down off of Facebook because people were complaining about saying, you're disgusting, you're sick, you should be killed. <laughs> the funniest thing about that was, my I have a public profile because I do stand-up comedy, I do other things. and. Yep. And a lot of these people I'm getting in the fights with, I don't even know who they are. People that know me know my sense of humor. Somebody was saying, I'm disgusting, I shouldn't be alive. And I'm looking at the name. Who is this? And he was friends with my mother. My mother said, oh, why is he yelling at you? I was laughing so hard. It was this older guy that was so disgusted <laughs> by my beautiful son, fetus, and myself. <laughs> so, I do have to say... I remember what was that? Go ahead. I remember that photo. It wasn't it just, I think um, Rich George had put the had put the baby fetus in his stroller. Yeah. Yes. And so it was just sitting in a stroller. It didn't even look gross or anything, really. It was just a prop sitting there. No, exactly. And it was just, it was all said in jest. And even if it wasn't, I mean, who cares? If you don't like it, yeah. move on. Just, you know, keep scrolling, okay? But That's fun. That, that was great. I mean, I was first introduced to you, and I have to say that you... And the rest of your crew are the nicest people because um, I saw you had the screen up and you were it was bone sickness at the time. I think it was like 2002, 2001, whenever that movie came out. Yep. And I said, oh, my God, I want to buy this. I went to the ATM. They were out of money. And you said, you know what? I could tell you like good movies. I really want you to have it. And you gave me the movie. And I've been hooked ever since. I bought the shirts. I bought all the DVDs. I've been telling everybody that. about it. That was the very first Rock and Shock yeah. Yep, that was the first Rock and Shock where I met you. Okay, I, so yeah, actually, I remember, I remember was, doing it. Yeah, yeah. though I, I want to thank you because I was a, a Morbid Vision film fan ever since. I've been hooked because, you know, sometimes you see a lot of these low-budget movies, you're like, yeah, these are okay, but your movies have a lasting impact. They are great story, great special effects, and believable acting, which really... A lot of those, um, a lot of independent movies don't have all of that, or a lot of low-budget movies, I should say. So, I mean, I highly recommend people who are watching this right now check out more. Do you have a website? Uh, actually, our website's down at the moment, mainly okay. because um, we sold out of a few titles, and we have to re-update it. We're going to redo the whole thing, so we have to actually have it down right now. But um, we're selling them on eBay. So okay. if you look, you can find our movies under Mobile Vision Films on eBay. All right, good. Definitely check it out. Now. We talked about, you said horror movies scared you. Was there one movie, because the reason I'm asking this, I interview a lot of musicians, and almost every musician has the same answer. When, when did you decide to pick up a guitar? And everybody says, the Beatles and Ed Sullivan. For you as a movie or a filmmaker, was there one movie that you watched and said, you know what, I want to buy a film, or I want to buy a camera, and I want to start making movies now? Was there one film that did that for you? I don't know if it was actually a film. It might have been the same thing that got me into makeup effects, which was the Fangoria video, Scream Greats, Volume 1 on Tom Savini. Ah. I think, because I don't remember, it might, well, 
it must have been the evil dead ah. because that's my favorite movie of all time all right and watching it and just love the setting of the woods and being out in the woods and me and rich judge used to we still love just you know goofing off doing whatever out there so that was probably what it was but i think the filmmaking side more or less came from as soon as i saw screen grades that weekend i wanted to learn how to start doing makeup effects <laughs> and, um, the filmmaking came from the fact that after months and months or a year or whatever spending hours and hours just to take a few photographs it became boring no i yeah. mean it wasn't boring but it didn't feel satisfying i wanted to try to find new ways to bring the effects to life yeah so like you know, every time i would watch uh, screen grades then you know george romero is a big part of that documentary so watching you know the behind the scenes of george romero directing dawn of the dead and day of the dead that i think that's what kind of got me hooked and really interested so once we finally gave it a shot we got a hold of a video camera that's when I became obsessed with that. I was just like hooked. I just wanted to keep filming stuff. All right. So when you first started, you wanted to become a special effects artist, which you're the master of. And like when you see his movies, you'll see what I'm talking about. So did you realize or say like, I want to make my own movies where I don't have anybody, any control. And somebody has control over my movie. So where I can show all my effects. Is that how you decided to become a filmmaker along with special effects? Or did you have aspirations to become an actor and then a director as well? It all just came from just wanting to have fun. It was basically, like I said, it was me and my friend Rich George. We're the ones that started off doing it right from the beginning. Before that, we were getting together like every weekend watching horror movies. We had what were called gore nights. And we'd go and try to find the goriest ones possible, Lucio Fulci movies and everything like that. Those are great. But, um, What's your favorite Fulci movie? City of the Living Dead. Yes. I love well, it. I love today, it. Gates of Hell. You saw the Gates of Hell box there originally back when we were getting the VHSs. I'm just like... This looks awesome. Actually, I remember because my aunt told me about it. One of my aunts told me when I was a kid. She's like, I saw this movie, and this girl pukes up all her intestines. Oh, my God. I'm like, whoa. All right. I got to remember that movie. <laughs> so I heard it. Was, I guess it's a rom-com, huh? <laughs> I was introduced to Fulci when I saw The Beyond, and right after that, I saw Zombie. Yep. So those two movies, and I said, I was hooked. I went, then I went back, you know, Don't Torture a Duckling, and cemetery gates i mean all those I, I love all his movies and like you said i can definitely see there's a huge uh, you know he was a huge inspiration with the blood and guts but i love i mean like just like him i think that you tell a good story to go along it's not your movies aren't all effects the effects are a part of the story which i love one thing one other major influence that fulci is for me is um just the atmosphere yes i love the shots he creates like just like in um well, the very beginning of uh, City of the Living Dead, just tracking across that graveyard. It's during the day, but it's creepy as hell, and the fog is slowly rolling. I love that stuff. Yes. No, All he, the shots he did like that was just, I wanted to recreate that stuff. Yeah. Well, it's funny. You mentioned um, Tom Savini. In the 80s, for me, it was Tom Savini, Rob Bottin, and uh, who's the other? Stan Winston and Rick yep. Baker. Those were the major, like, you know, American Werewolf in London, Rick Baker, Rob Bottin, the thing. Tom Savini, Dawn of the Dead, there's so many others. And yep. um, I like the fact, too, that he is the same as you. It's like he, you know, wanted to be a filmmaker. I mean, he wanted to be an actor as well. So a lot, a lot of the movies he acted in, you know, like Dawn of the Dead and um, what was the other one? It was um, From Dust Till Dawn and so many others. Uh, I like how he's sort of just like you. What was that? Night Riders. He plays a big yes. part. Night he's really yeah, good in it, too. Oh, no, he's, he's a really good actor. Actually, do you have Shudder? Yeah. Yeah. There's a great documentary, which I'm sure you saw. It's all about Tom Savini and his life. Yeah. Smoke and Mirrors. Yeah. I saw it on there. Oh, cool. It, I loved watching that because it felt like back seeing Scream Greats for the first time again. Yeah. It got me. It, it was perfect timing, too, because it was actually within the first or the second week that I got laid off during this you know, pandemic thing. Yeah. And I'll admit, I, just, I was lost. I was just like, because we were open for the longest time. So I, we, we didn't get shut down, but then all of a sudden I got forced out of work and I'm like, Oh no, oh. not, not being unemployed again, blah, blah, blah. So it really messed with my head. And then I saw uh, smoke and mirrors on it. So I watched it one day and it's like, I just forgot the whole rest of the world. And I'm just like, Oh, this is awesome. This is like being a teenager again. <laughs> no, I mean, you, you do a lot of the conventions. Have you ever met him? Oh yeah. Met yeah, him a few times. Um, first met him actually at spooky world. Oh, really? oh wow. In I forgot it was Berlin mass. 
Yeah, yeah. we were actually, yeah, it was the very first year. Um, me and Rich, we worked at Spooky World. Um, his aunt actually lived right down the road for them. So she told us all about it. We got in there, we went for, you know, fill our applications. We ended up working there the whole month of, of October, their first year. And we're hanging around one night and they said they were going to have this little convention on um, the Saturday night or Friday and Saturday night, whatever it was, the, like the second weekend of the month. And all of a sudden the owner just casually says, oh, yeah, so we're going to have Tom Savini here, Kane Hodder. And I'm like, what? what, what? <laughs> I'm like, Tom Savini's going to be here? Oh, my God. I'm flipping out. Because back then there was nothing in Massachusetts. No. The only way, it was Fangoria or Chiller in new york and new jersey and when i was a teenager that that, that might as well have just been california yeah because so to find out that tom savini was going to be where we're working i just it was just amazing so finally got to meet him then we got we became friends with kane hotter through that oh really because he was he was there every single night he worked the whole month so yeah. um and we were the you know we were the horror geeks there, so we're like we're like hey how's it going we're talking with him all the time so he would come up and he's like hey guys how's it going and stuff so Spooky World was great because we got to meet Tom, got to get to know Kane, we became friends with Kane through that. Has Kane and ever then, um, been, did Kane ever offer to be in one of your movies? We asked him once and um, he said he would like to, but back, it was when we first started and we didn't know anything about the Screen Actors Guild and stuff like yeah. that. We were just yeah. too fancy up to said, hey, it was at Spooky World we asked him. Yeah. And um, it was actually like the third year of it. And we asked him if he would be interested in doing it. But that's when he was the one that told me about all that. He's like, oh, you got to go to the Screen Actors Guild, blah, 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 and you know, this, that. I was like, oh, all right. I just didn't. Because, we're again, we're just fans doing it for fun. Yeah. Well, you know what's funny? I'm sure you know who Lloyd Kaufman is from Troma. Yeah. He, I met him several times at a couple of the conventions. And he was filming movies in, like, in the hotel where they were staying. And he was like, that's, ah, I like to help out local filmmakers. And I was talking to Tom Savini. He said the same thing too. He said, he goes, um, he goes, look at Quentin Tarantino. The guy used to work at a video store. He goes, after that story, I will help out any filmmaker I can because you never know who's going to be the next superstar. He's, yeah, really? I, I love the fact that like all these people, because I go to a lot of the same conventions that you, you do and I meet a lot of the same people. And a lot of them, like Kane is such a great down to earth guy. Tom Savini is the best. Um, it's funny. There's a TV show that I'm sure you saw. It's called Holliston. The guy who oh, directed yeah. Hostel. But yep. Kane Hatter has a recurring role in there, and it's hilarious. <laughs> yeah, he's on um, Wax. Yeah, I was just watching today. I think it's on Shutter. I was watching the, the documentary on Kane Hatter. Oh, really? That I checked that on one that. out. Yeah, I didn't realize it's it's really, it really burns. Yeah, it goes into all that. It's really done really well. But the one part I loved in Holliston was how the episode where he's suicidal because he's all upset about um, losing the part of Jason or Freddy versus Jason. Yes. So in Hollywood, he's just, he's all depressed. He tries hanging himself in the shower. And I was like, that's the greatest thing. That was like so funny to see yeah. him doing that. <laughs> well, what's his name? Adam Green, right? Yeah, Adam Green is the Adam director. Green, yeah. yeah, and he filmed, I think, part of that Rock and Shock, unless they, re maybe it was like a fake Rock and Shock, but they, in, the, in the series, which you probably saw that episode, they go to Rock and Shock and they're trying to introduce, yeah. it was a um, girl, from, girl from Halloween, Danielle Harris. They're trying to get into yeah, one of their movies. Yeah, yeah. John this was in it. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that was the same episode. And John yep. Lance like, get away from me, get away from me. <laughs> now I know special effects is what you originally started off and you you started writing and directing, producing, but a lot of people don't know this, but you uh worked with a little known director named Steven Spielberg. <laughs> Tell me about how that went. Tell me about that experience. Yeah, that was a dream come true. That was when um what was it, ninety five, I think they were filming in Newport, Rhode Island. And um I don't know if I saw it or my parents saw it. Someone saw the little ad that was in one of the local papers saying extras wanted. So we went to it, me and Rich went to it. And um, unfortunately, Rich didn't get called. But um, I, the first thing they asked me when they called me back on the phone, they're like, you still have long hair? I'm like, yep. They're like, okay. <laughs> and they said, don't shave. I was like, okay. That was the first time I ever grew facial hair. And um, I got to be an extra for five days on the set. Now, which was that was great. for Amistad, right? Yep. Amistad, yep. All right, I'll check it out. So it was what during the the court scene? Um, the first, uh, the first two or three days, I was mostly on the street, and I was with you know, there was like, like maybe fifty of us to a hundred people on the street, and um, there was one part where they had all the slaves walking through the street. Yeah, and I actually felt bad from that day because that day was cold. It was April. It was windy, and they're just wearing like basically like loincloths. 
and we're all freezing in our suits and stuff. <laughs> but um, so I was mostly on the street at first. I'm like, oh, this is cool, you yeah, know, whatever. But um, you know, I didn't get to see anybody. And then I they called me back for the following week, so I went for two more days, and then they put me right in the courtroom. Wow. So I was like, oh, this is amazing. So I was right there in the courtroom. I'm watching Steven Spielberg. Steven Spielberg's there. Morgan Freeman's there. Um, wow. Oh, I forgot his name. Uh, the guy that was in Jurassic Park 2 as the head hunt, dinosaur hunter. I, he, I know you're talking about. I can't think of his name. Yeah. But he was there. He, he was fascinating to watch. But just to be able to watch Spielberg work. And actually, one part, they were getting a close-up of someone. And where I, where I was sitting like the five of us that were right there just happened to be like the background for it. Yeah. And um, first time I ever learned about um, Spielberg came up to us and told us how to act in slow motion. So we all had to act in slow motion while the actor was doing his thing. And the reason why was so we didn't take the focus away from the, the actor in the foreground. That's so funny. Like, oh. That shot actually, I, you can see my shoulder in that shot, but then later on for the court scene, I didn't even know they were doing this shot. They were getting different shots around the courtroom. And I had got, I kind of got a close up in the actual finished movie. It was me and two other guys, and I'm right in the middle, and the camera just happens to move up, and there we are. So yeah. that was pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. I know somebody that was an extra in one of his other movies. They said he was such a great guy. They said he was like really nice, really down to earth. I mean, I'm not sure how much if you even had a chance to talk to him, but it must have been nice seeing him work though. Like, is he is he really uh, all involved, or is he more of like an off hands? Like, you know what? The assistant director is going to take care of this. The DO, the director of photography, will take care of that. Or is he more hands-on? He was pretty much hands-on. Yeah, I mean, uh, everyone did, were doing their thing, and um, but he was like, it was cool to see like the whole just well-oiled machine working. Yeah. He had his thing. I made sure everyone was doing it, but he let the lighting guys do it. The only time I ever saw him in the courtroom, he actually kind of got a little upset. Was they were trying to do this down? It was on the floor. This light box to get a certain amount of light coming up on an actor. And it was taking a while. And that's the only time he was like, come on guys, this is taking way too long. It needs to be. But aside from that, he was just like, he just looked like a really just laid back. Yes. Yeah. yeah Joe, I, I just missed a chance to talk to him. I had uh, one opportunity where they're all telling us to go, it was after lunch. They're all telling us to go up the stairs, the courtroom, the strange courtrooms, courtrooms on the second floor in that building in Newport. Yeah. And just as I'm coming to the stairs, he just comes in the front door. I'm like, oh my God, this Spielberg right there. I'm like, oh my God, we're gonna end up on the same set of stairs. So we come in, be funneled. I come right next to him. A guy comes right in between us. Oh. So it's three of us on the end. It's another guy in Spielberg. And the guy in the middle would not shut up. He's like, oh, oh my God, Mr. Spielberg, blah, blah, blah. I never got a chance to say anything because the guy in the middle wouldn't stop talking. And then as soon as we get to the top of the stairs, Spielberg went that way and I had to go that way. It's like, that was my one chance to say hi to him. <laughs> yeah. You could have been in the next sequel to Jurassic Park. Yeah. Who knows? <laughs> I got to say hi to Morgan Freeman, so that was cool. <laughs> What's he, he seems like a nice guy, too. Oh, he was nice. he, he yeah, was really nice. He, he seems like he's another one who's like really down to earth. And I, I like these people that you meet who would like, you know, like, like I met Martin Landau. Just so down to earth, so nice, and so grateful and appreciative. Like George Hamilton yep. was another one. It's like sometimes you get like these newer stars. I meet these conventions and they don't even want to be bothered. And they think they're like, you're too oh, good yeah. for it. The older ones seem like they're so like another one for, if we're talking about horror, Bruce Campbell, he's so funny, very appreciative. Oh, yeah. and he, he knows the fans. He's there because of the fans. And he yep. just, he, he thrives off their energy. So, I mean, I love people like that that really know why they're there. And like, without us, they wouldn't be where they are. And it seems mm -hmm. like they, you know, some of these people that we met were like that. It was interesting. One thing that was interesting about being on the set with, like, with them, is like you're told right off the bat, you're here to work. Yeah. You're not here to bother the stars. All yes. the, you know. So it was like you knew you had to have this work ethic. So there's one point we're all just standing there waiting to be see if we're being used for the next scene. And Morgan Freeman walks by. It was the one time I said, I "Got to say hi to him." But at the same time, everyone we just also said, said hi, and that's it. No one went up to him and be like, "Oh, Mr. Freeman," blah blah blah. Yeah, and yeah. he just went off. Right. And he was quiet. He was just sitting there because you could tell he's going through his lines through his head. So yeah. it was like, yeah, it was great. You get to see him. He's really nice. But at the same time, you had to have that respect. You couldn't like bother him yeah. or any of the other actors. Well, I had a friend of mine was um, an extra in The Irishman, Martin Scorsese's latest movie. And he said there was one part, there was a part where Ed Norton plays Don Rickles. And this one extra just kept staring at Joe Pesci and looking at him. And, and Martin Scorsese says, what the f 
fuck are you doing here? You call yourself a fucking ass. He was going off, off on him and going on and on. He goes, you are so the most unprofessional ass. I mean, he was just telling me, he's like, I can't believe, like, the poor guy probably never even uh, came back after that. He was just mortified. But, yeah, so I, mean, like, I, I do understand that in a way. I mean, you don't have to be like that. But just, like, you have all these big actors and you have, like, people that, you know, who first time on a movie set, they're going to, of course, want to, like, talk to all the stars. So, I mean, they probably have to set the tone right away. It's like, we're here for a job. They, they, we need to get the work done. So, but yeah. getting back to you. Now, uh, we, a lot of your movies, I think, are more um, foreign influence. Like I said, uh, the Fulci, Argento, or do you prefer American movie, American horror movies to uh, foreign movies, or do you like a little bit of both? I love them all. Yeah. I love everything. I mean, the, you know, the Italian, 80s Italian horror, obviously a huge influence. It just happens to be that um, all my favorite horror films are from the, pretty much the 80s and the 70s, and they all just happen to be American movies. Yeah. But also, I love love Japanese horror. I love what the Japanese do. South Korea makes amazing horror films. Um, so yeah, I, I love movies from all over the world. It's not really considered a horror movie, but to me, I thought it was the best movie of last year. What did you think of Parasite? I, I still have seen it. Oh I my have to God. See it. Yeah. I saw it before like the hype. I didn't even, there, there was a, I live in Connecticut and there's a place called Real Artway Cinema. So they play independent movies. I saw the trailer. I said, this this is the best trailer because the teaser trailers it does exactly what it's supposed to do. just tease you doesn't tell, really tell you what it's about but gets you to want to learn more about it didn't tell me anything i walked into the theater saying i have to see this again tomorrow i mean that's how good it is it's yeah. it, you it's going in one direction then it completely does a 180 you have no idea what's happening but i was just thinking about that because i think that is south korean if i'm correct yeah yep. yeah yeah, and South, then, South, the way South Korea makes their movies, their the characterizations are just amazing. They really tell really good character movies. Yeah, well, I think that's so important. So many people, and this is Gene Siskel had a great comment before he died. You know, Siskel and Ebert said the last good movie was made in the '70s before CGI because back then you had to rely on character development and a good story. Now it's all about CGI. It's like, how many explosions can we get in this scene? Like, trans, yep. just use an example, Transformers or. And I think the movie that sort of ruined it for me when it first started coming out was the movie Twister. Like the oh, whole yeah. movie for me was, hey, there's a Twister. Wait, there's a bigger one. Wait, there's another one. They were basically just showing yeah. off like how good the CGI's were. And it really, to me, it didn't really have that good of a story. I prefer that. I love like what you just said, a great movie that has great character development. The Shining is a great example. Yeah. Where, I mean, it just builds and builds and builds. The tension builds up and finally, bam, Jack Nicholson freaks out. But instead of like now, I think audiences, and you can tell me what you think. I think that more, it's more like we want the action right away. I don't want to wait an hour and 10 minutes until the, uh, the killing start. I want the killing and then maybe do a flashback scene of what happened six months earlier. You know? Yep. I think exactly. people have, it's ADD nation. I'll admit, even because of that, my movies, I always make sure I, I, we call it the kicker scene at the beginning. I'm like, okay, I know my movie. People watch my movies for the gore. I yeah. know why they come to see it. So I do always make sure I put a scene at the very beginning for the credits, nail you right off the bat, and then we make you wait as we tell the character story. No, well, no, I see, I love that. And that's great. It's sort of like the James Bond movies. They have that one killer scene in the beginning where James Bond does something, and then the rest yep. of the movie sort of builds up to like he has to catch a spy in Russia. You know, whatever the whatever the premise is. But yeah, no, I, I love that. But if you just did all gore after gore after gore, I think it would sort of become tiring. Yeah, it's boring. Yeah, you, I mean, <laughs> you, you have a great story, but you're right. Every movie you have, the beginning just kicks off and you're like, all right, now I have to watch the rest of this. I want to find out what happens. So I, I, I love your style of making, of movie making. Thank you. An now example, no character, I say. An example of no character building or anything. I just watched a couple of weeks ago, that new movie, Underwater. Oh, yeah, it was horrible. It wanted to be alien so bad. And it's just, I wanted to watch it because I heard someone hinted that, like, it's, the, it's like the closest you're going to get to Cthulhu in a movie. I'm like, well, I have to watch this movie. So um, as soon as it starts, I'm like, all right, there's a voiceover, and then boom, explosion. Oh, I'm like, yeah. you don't get to know any of these people. Who cares about these characters? Yeah. Was that, that's the, the, one, movie, that's just, the little uh, Kristen Stewart, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's what I thought. It was, I was, excuse me, I was so bored. And after a while, like you said, um, who just got killed? I don't know, and I don't care. Yeah. That, and when you, when you get to that point, 
It was similar. I just did um, another show I do called Real Talk where I talk about movies. We just, uh, my friend and I were talking about the thing, the thing uh, prequel, and then the thing from another world. And I said, I love the 1982 John Carpenter because he has great characters and you care about them. The thing 2011, people are getting killed. I can't, I don't know one of their names. I don't know what they look like. I mean, I got so confused because they're all, you know, it was supposed to be the Norwegians before the first, before 1982. And yep. I just lost track and I really didn't care. But when you have great, that's another movie that sort of builds slowly and slowly and just, you know, it's like, it just burns for a while until the end. But, uh, and it, again, I'm not sure if you, I'm sure you're a big fan of Rob Bottin as well. He, oh, absolutely. Have you ever met him? No, I've never met. I heard he, I heard he doesn't really do many conventions. Yeah. I guess he's done some Fango ones back in the early days, but. He's very, very reclusive, <laughs> I've heard. Well, he, he was, I saw an interview with him, and he did the howling at age 20. The thing was 22. And, even, and I look at that now. The special effects in 1982 were so much better than the CGI in 2001. It looked more realistic. And they were puppets with Stan Winston. He did part of it. I mean, I, we can go on and yeah. on about that. But now for your movies, do you ever – I'm thinking of this because I just learned it's the dogs and the thing were puppets. Do you ever use anything like that, or is it all props? Like I see something in the back, you create them, and or do mm -hmm. you have, like, different things that you do? Oh, uh, yeah. Everything's made from scratch pretty much. Wow. Starts off, you know, with clay, sculpting clay on the plaster, uh, molds we make from actors. Um, since I've been doing it for so long, one, re one way I'm able to do so many effects, is uh unfortunately i don't save anything uh never. there's like never it's never going to be a more vision films museum of all the props because uh -huh. everything gets down and reused so like actually if that zombie that's in the background that was actually that one there was for a movie um i did a small scene directed a small uh, cameo scene of me and rich and um a couple other friends for a movie in belgium called zombies from sector nine so i made i had to make uh, all my other zombies were like that fallen apart or whatever so i made them a brand new zombie but that's from the blood pigs mold ah so i knew i liked them i liked the way the mold came out like the you know, sculpt on it so i was like all right i'll just use the blood pigs one so it's a blood pig zombie that's in his movie uh, <laughs> Same with um, some of the stuff, some of the zombies in Bone Sickness. I think um, some of them were older molds I had made that I never used for anything, but I knew I needed some more zombies. Grabbed an old mold from years ago and made a zombie, you know, made up a new zombie out of that design. Uh, Cryptic Plasm definitely was so many recycled stuff because the stuff was so big in that, that yeah. eight foot tall plasm thing at the end of the movie. That was basically everything I ever saved, like in, in drawers and everything. I was pulling out everything from all years past, and I'm hot wooling it to this thing. Whatever happened to my baby fetus? <laughs> that got saved. Oh, good. <laughs> the baby, yeah, that's what the, the baby fetus and the, <clears throat> the boil wife from fetus, her head was saved because I managed, because, um, Usually, like, I want the skulls that I build them on because I always use them as formations, you know, to build more effects on. Mm -hmm. I had three of those. So I'm like, you know what? This one can stay aside. I still have two more. So I always, um, her head is still in the garage. And I actually, a lot of times I'll bring her to conventions. I put her next to whatever the monitor where we're playing trailers on. Yeah. Um, the fetus baby is pretty beat up by now, unfortunately. Because <laughs> one thing that happens with sometimes with a uh, foam latex, if it's pulled or depending on how it's shaped or how it's in place, it'll start to rot. The air bubbles get into it and make yeah. openings eventually. So the fetus baby is starting to rot away a little bit. Ah, uh, <laughs> my poor baby boy. <laughs> yeah, the boils basically fell off the bottom part. So it, the baby has legs again. <laughs> <laughs> now we were talking about Shutter TV earlier. Have you seen some of the um, original Shutter movies? I've, I've been watching some of them. What's more, the only uh, positive thing for me out of the being stuck home is I'm finally watching movies again. Yeah. I went through a phase where I went a year and a half. I wasn't watching anything anymore. Wow. I don't know why, but now all of a sudden, I'm, now that I'm home, I'm finally watching a bunch of movies. So yeah, I've seen some good ones on there. Yeah, I was going to say, it's like Mayhem. I wanted to re recommend that or Daniel Isn't Real. That stars 
um, Miles Robbins, which is Tim Robbins and Susan Strand's son, and Patrick Schwarzenegger, which is you know Arnold's son. It's a great movie. It's one of those movies. I'll have to check that out. Where, yeah, where Patrick Schwarzenegger, without giving too much away, he is a friend that was created from Miles Robbins because he was Miles was bullied and he comes back, but he becomes real. It's it's a really good movie. It's I'll have a, to check that out. I keep seeing yeah. the the artwork, but I wasn't quite sure about it. Yeah, but yeah, I'll have to check that out. Well, you know what I like because um, we're friends on Facebook and I see some of your posts and you mentioned the curse movies and I was laughing so hard because I agree with you 100%. They can find anything, you know, oh, I mean, if you look at all the movies, do you think John Ritter died because of the curse of Problem Child 2? I don't think so. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but because it was I mean, a horror movie, oh, the devil did it on the, on the Omen yeah. or The Exorcist. No, they, no he didn't. Uh, the, the episode on The Omen was just just stupid. I couldn't believe just, it was like insulting. <laughs> and I was like, okay, all right, fine. They're still pushing this thing to, you know, publicize the movie. But when they had like the black magician talking about, it's like, shut up. Seriously. It's like, come on. I mean, right now, actually the room I'm sitting in, this is my basement. Yeah. It's just the easiest one. To, I will admit my drum set is like right behind my camera and behind my camera is a full-size Baphomet flag from the Church of Satan. And it's there <laughs> because it fits with my band music. But I just because I have a flag of a Baphomet, my house is not cursed. No. It's not, no, there's no you know, black cloud over my house because of this. You know, they make it sound like, oh my God, if you deal with the devil, shut up. I it's know. so stupid. Well, you know, I'm not sure if that's the same Church of Satan, but there's a documentary about them, I think. And it, Oh, yeah, I saw that. It, Oh, it's, it's hilarious. And the funny thing is, if you, I mean, people who are watching this might say, oh, I can't believe they're saying this, but their tenets are actually way better than the Ten Commandments. I mean, they basically want you to respect other people. They want you to yep. like, you know, there was one person that got kicked out of the Church of Satan and she goes, how extreme do you have to be? Because she was just doing some weird things and they're like, no, you're not our kind of people. So, I mean, they're yeah, actually... So just trying way too hard to be, I'm so evil, look what I'm yeah. doing. And at yeah. the end of just, yeah, she ruined it for like her whole, that whole area, wherever she was. Yeah. Just being stupid. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, they're, the, basically, they're just basically a human rights group, really. Exactly. And it was all, the whole thing about the statue, and they put the statue over there, and they wanted to see, people want to take it away. No, that's her right to keep it there. And I mean, there's, it's, check, I can't remember the name of it right now, but maybe I'll put Hail it Satan. in post. Hail Satan. Yep, that's it. Called check Hail that Satan out. with question mark. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I saw that not having any idea what it was and that's another one where i said i gotta see this again because it's done very well and like i was saying the tenants that they have are much better than the ten commandments and they're just it's not it's not all evil they're not sacrificing bodies it has nothing nope. to do with satan at all nope <laughs> i went to the one in salem cool place oh really oh i, I went there years ago. yeah, yeah. Uh, oh really I yeah, How well, it? it's an art gallery now, but now it's opened up, like, I don't think it's open right now. Well, obviously, it's not open now, but um, I think they open up during the summer and the fall, mostly. Okay. But uh, it's it's the Salem Art Museum, but it'll say, I think it says, the, the Satanic Temple, Salem Art Museum, and it's a black oh. black building you go in, and that's where the statue is. I got my photo taken with the statue. I think so it's they cool. have it. Oh, really? Yeah, they have it in there. Salem right yep. now? All right, yep. I'll check that out. I didn't realize that. Now, you mentioned drums, so you're a musician, like I mentioned in the intro. So, you, were you always a drummer? No, actually, that came out of necessity, mainly. I started playing guitar when I was a freshman in high school, and uh, so I've always just played guitar my whole life, and I've always, you know, made the attempts to get a band going, never been fully successful with it, but um, once I decided I really wanted to record some music, I could never find drummers that were fast enough that played, you know, I played black metal. And I play like the fastest version of black metal, you know, and that type. Of course. So, why did I ever, why did I ever doubt you? <laughs> the most extreme, another extreme, of course. But I could never find drummers that could, that could play fast enough. So I was using a drum machine, and I got sick of doing that. I didn't like the way it sounded. It just felt like cheating. So I said the hell with that. I bought two used drum sets, put them together, so I had the true double bass. Yeah. And spent years and years just trying to learn how to do it, and I'm finally at a point now where. Um, like comfortable with what I can do so but it, yeah I, I learned I, I learned how to play simply because if I want to record music I have no choice I have to do it do you do music for your own soundtracks like for your movies um yeah uh 
a lot of times, um, some of the early ones, it was all me. I would rent a keyboard from, um, uh, from music stars locally, but then that, that started becoming more difficult to do. I met some other people, uh, Fetus, my friend, Matt Meserve. He, um, he's the one that came up with that really nice piece at the beginning in the hospital scene. Mm -hmm. And then the whole finale while I'm doing the ritual, that piece, he did all that music. I love that piece. I love what he did there. Oh, and then he also came up with some stuff for Blood Pigs. And then he let, I rented his keyboard from him. And all the lesser musical stuff throughout the movie is me. <laughs> me oh. faking it on keyboards. I can fake it. I can do all right. Um, Morbid Tales is hopefully coming out soon in a couple of months. I did all the music for that one. Now, what's that but, about? Uh, what's that Morbid Tales about? Is it an anth anthology or trilogy? Yeah, that's the, that's the anthology. Okay. Um, we fought, the one we finally did because everyone – over the years, so many people kept asking to see the very first short films we ever did because I had pictures of them. I had little descriptions on the website, but I wasn't comfortable selling them because I'm like, no, nah, they're our first movies. They, the quality is terrible. We didn't really know what we were doing. But then finally I brainstormed and I'm like, I came up with this idea of this anthology where shooting all new wraparound stuff. I'm like, okay, you know what? If we do a new wraparound and we f make another finale just as big as what we're known for for our finales, then I'll feel comfortable releasing it. So I'm happy with what we did. So now it's fun. Then people will get to see the original, the very first three we ever did. All right. Now, is that going to be coming out soon or because of the pandemic, did you stop filming or are you just working on your own with the effects? It's been done. The movie has been finished for three years. Okay. It's basically the first time where everything basically came. We just weren't able to release it because we didn't have the money. No. It was like, it just one of those situations where like, what the hell? We can't do this. We can't pull this off. How are we going to do this? And then finally, we have a distributor in Europe who handles all of our European sales called Black Lava. Mm -hmm. And um, great company. Uh, independent. They're really into the extreme stuff. But um, so they, uh, we had, we made the mask. Wait, how did we do that? I'm trying to remember how we did this. <laughs> we did some stuff here sent all the materials back to them they made their master because being europe they all and their germany is right next door they didn't want to have german subtitles so they did all the german subtitles for that mm -hmm. sent it back to us we created a master that was all region playable all over the world they for some reason they weren't able to get the ntsc to work mm -hmm. because they're all pal all europe and earth is the pal format so we were able to transfer it here, sent the master back to them. So right now we're in the process. It should be getting to them any day now. And then they're going to take the master. They're doing, they've got the artwork pretty much all set now. And then they're going to send out the master copy and have them duplicated. So they're having it created. We're going to buy copies from them. They're supplying with us with a bunch of them. So then we'll finally have it available. We'll sell it here in the United States. They'll sell it all over Europe. And they sell all over the world too as well. Right. Well, you know, that makes me think of something. Years ago, in the uh, golden age of video stores, Hollywood Home Video, I was in the horror section, and I saw Bone Sickness. Did you have a uh, foreign distributor? How did you get picked up by Because I know most of your movies are done on Morbid Vision. Is that correct? That's your film company. Yeah. Did you have somebody pick up Bone Sickness, like a major company? Yep. Um, that was, Bone Sickness was the first time we tried doing it ourselves. Uh, at Dawn they, Soon to Be Dead, At Dawn They Sleep, and Dead Girl on Film were all put out by three different dis, uh, distributors. And even though it gave us some exposure, there was never, there was always lies. <laughs> we were always getting lied to. Yeah. Why there's no yeah. royalty checks? Why this? Why that? Uh, of course. And once I got married and Stacy decided, she's like, she's like, let me do it. Let me become the business manager. Let me sell our movies. We'll, we'll place the order. We'll have the professional DVDs made. Yeah. So bone sickness was the first one we did that way. And we sold it for about a year on our own. It, it took a long time because we still weren't really known then, even though we already had like three other movies out, it took us a while to get noticed. Bone sickness was the one where what we're known for, everything clicked. Because that's on the, that's when I came onto the picture too. That was like the first movie I was introduced <laughs> to you guys by, and uh, seeing that one, and that's when I went back and watched everything else. But so, Bone Sickness. Who were they picked up by? What was the name of the company? Uh, Unearth Films. Oh, Unearth yeah. Films. They were the ones that were known for um, releasing the Japanese guinea pig series in America. So they were the ones releasing the most extreme stuff into America at the time. 
So, um, and then it just had me a chance email that Stacy sent. She was asking about the, their DVD, uh, the movie Aftermath, wondering when that was because she saw that on their website. Yeah. She used the business email and he, they wrote back and they said, hey, what's with this more vision films and blah, blah, blah. And it just went from there. So we, we ended up signing bone sections with them. We added more scenes to their version because they were a little Larry that we were already selling it for about a year. Mm-hmm. And I was like, hey, there was some stuff I actually wish I could have done that I didn't do. Like the our version was kind of like the demo version, yeah. and then we got to go back and add different things, fix some stuff, and then that was their version. So they they're the reason why they worked with um, middleman distributors that got stuff out into retail stores. So that's how we ended up at Hollywood Video. Oh, good. And then after that, you went back to uh, just release. That's when you started releasing movies on your own. Just yeah, they, was they like... were interested. There was a couple of companies that were interested in Fetus, but. We were just, uh, I don't know, I can't remember exactly what exactly happened, what it was, but we're like, you know what, let's go back and handle it ourselves again. And I knew Feet was going to be a lot smaller. It wasn't as big as Bone Sickness, and it's more extreme. Like, there's no way Fetus is going to get into Hollywood video anyways. It's too extreme. Exactly. So I'm like, let's handle it ourselves. Did Unearthed Films ever tell you to delete something or get rid of this scene or change that? Did they ever censor anything? Nope. Oh, oh, good. Right. No, they love the fact that we put at, we put all the extra scenes into bone sickness. All right, yeah. Well, let's get back to music for a minute. Well, first of all, I love your shirt, Wendy O. Williams. Oh, Not yeah. Wendy Williams, Wendy O. And it's funny, she <laughs> lived in Connecticut. I live in Connecticut. She was a veterinarian for a while before she committed suicide. Really? Yep. No way. Not too oh, far did from you her. Get to, did you no, ever get to meet her? No, I wish I did. I didn't yeah. find out until after her suicide. And I was reading the article about her. I said, oh, wait, she's a veterinarian? Wait, she lives in three towns away from here? So I would have loved to have met her because I, I'm a huge fan of Plasmatics. I still remember that video where she's driving the bus through the TV sets. Yeah, yep. that was it. I, I love Plasmatics. She's amazing. She, she was, I mean, she was like a stunt person practically. She was the like the most badass yes. lead singer, any like male or female ever. I mean, she put her life on the line all the time in her videos. She was crazy. <laughs> um. There's two things I want to talk about. So we, you said you like the, the black metal, right? Death metal. Yep. Lords of Chaos. I'm sure you know the band that the movie was based on. How yep. accurate is that movie? Probably three. I'd say probably three quarters accurate. Obviously, they had embellished stuff to tell a story for a movie. Oh, yeah, so exactly. there were some things, on certain parts, I was like, all right, that's weird. I mean, I'm par- supposedly the whole, I think the, the female character, his girlfriend, I think they said, I think I read that um, they invented that character. There was no girl. Uh, okay. He didn't. Yeah. He didn't. There was the whole scene with him cutting his hair at the end. That never happened, supposedly. But a lot of the other stuff, um, they recreated things very well. I mean, if you look at old, if you search and then you try to find old pictures of mayhem, you'll see like perfect recreations. The spray paint on the walls is perfect. Oh, everything gosh. else. So yeah, I really liked it. I thought they did a really good job, and the violence was just brutal as hell. I, I was like at the end was great. I mean, it was a huh. great way to end. Like, because I didn't know the story. I knew the story about burning the church. I knew the story about, but I forgot that he got killed. And when that happened, I was like, wow. Like, it just surprised me because I wasn't expecting <laughs> that ending. But you know who was great? I mean, I forgot what his first name was, but his last name, obviously, it's Macaulay's brother, something Culkin, not Kieran, yep. was one of the Culkins. But you know who was great it was Vel Kilmer's son. He played the original lead singer when it kept cutting himself. He committed suicide, I think. Oh, okay, that was Bob Kilmer's. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, I didn't know either. I was I was doing some research on the movie after I saw it, and I found that out. But yeah, he did a. The, the movie was very well done, and of course, like you said, everything's got to be embellished for Hollywood. Yeah. Uh, the other well, thing, thought, yeah. it was yeah. You liked it? I thought they did. I thought they did a good job on it. Yeah. Now there's a documentary on another band that I know that you're a fan of because I think from what I saw, it's the last record you bought before this whole pandemic started. It's a band called Death. There's a documentary all about oh, yeah. that band. And I did not realize, because I saw them live, and I didn't realize Chuck, the lead singer, the leader of the band, the founder of the band, he hated touring. He loved being home. Every time he went on mm-hmm. tour, they would have to cancel. He was like, I want to go home. I don't like being on the road. I mean, I didn't realize like how much he hated. Be- he just wanted to stay home and watch TV and record music. He hated touring. And I've seen them several times at small clubs in Connecticut. In the, I want to say late 80s, early 90s. And, they're like yep. one of my favorite death metal bands. 
Yeah, I, I uh, rented that. It was on Amazon. I just came across it, so I watched it. And yeah, I was I was actually really surprised that just I don't want to. I'm not trying to say anything bad about him, but he seemed a little difficult to work with. <laughs> I was really surprised at that. And I saw I saw them on their on the second album, the, the Leprosy album. Yeah. I saw them on the Leprosy tour, and I saw them at the living room in Providence, Rhode Island. And oh, yeah. I was uh, after seeing them like wow I'm glad I got lucky I saw them because apparently a couple of weeks after that he canceled his tour he just told the band he just made the whole band go home <laughs> wow, yeah. so I'm like wow I'm lucky I saw him before he bailed yeah I'm trying to think because there's a drummer the, the drummer for Iced Earth I can't remember his name um he's on the Howard Stern show but he was part of death for a little while I'd have to look his name up but um I, I don't I'm not sure if I saw him in the band because I know that he went to Iced Earth right after that and then he was only in the band for a short time, but I saw him in a small club. It was like basically a warehouse as big as this room that I'm in right now. And oh, yeah. they were always one of my favorite bands of that era. And it's just that, yeah, watching that documentary, I was very surprised by some of the allegations. And I thought the same thing too. I'm like, wow, I didn't realize how difficult he was though. Yeah. They still uh, produce great music. And I, he, I guess he can actually sing and he wanted to do more melodic stuff. They so came out with the other band, which was, I listened to, I still like Death better, but they were pretty good. The band yeah. after Death. Now, uh, I want to get back into your movies. I, I like to go back and forth. I mean, there's really no rhyme or reason to this. I just like talking to you because there's so many interesting stories that you have. Now, one of your movies was stolen. I remember this. Did they ever find the guy that stole your movie? You, were, you had the master tapes, I think, and somebody broke into your house and stole the movie. Is that oh, true? I know it's it probably a while ago. But. It was just, um, yeah, a house got robbed. It was, we had basically finished filming Fetus and um the camera was stolen and there was a footage tape in the camera so oh. we only we only lost one footage tape which oh, luckily good. it only had like three scenes on it but what scared me and i think i wrote about it once on facebook was um two days before for some reason because i had this really nice case that it was like waterproof and everything yeah for some reason i just decided to put all the master tapes to be safe inside the case and i closed it and then two days or the night before, or no, it must have been two days before, I opened them like, no, I never do that. I put them back on the editing desk. And it's a good thing I did because wow. the whole case was stolen. <laughs> wow. And so Fetus would have disappeared just like that if I hadn't taken the footage tapes out of the case. Wow. Did that they ever was... find the guy? No. No, the cops didn't even care. Yeah. We had the cops in the house, and they, they could care less. They just did their report. They're like, just call the insurance company. My, I had um, the Dawn of the Dead Elite box set laser disc in a nice shiny case that's up, that was up on the entertainment center. They, they pulled the entertainment center forward to unplug everything. And I don't know if that thing was falling. They actually took it and put it on the couch. You can see his fingerprints on the plastic oh. glossy. I showed the cop, I go, look, there's his fingerprints. Yeah. They don't care. Yeah, they don't care. I mean, they didn't, like, I mean, you know, maybe if, maybe if it was a gone with the wind that went, went missing or, you know, <laughs> but, you know, fetus. All right, guys, we'll wrap this up. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm sorry to but, hear that. But because of that, like I said, we had to go back and we had to refilm that footage. Yeah. But at that, but then by that point, I was just pissed. <laughs> I was so too. a lot of model my rage and anger from that. A little bit more. It's, it, fetus became a bit more brutal than the first, the first time we rapped. <laughs> That's the best silver lining story I've ever heard. <laughs> it made me more angry and more. So, but are there, is, what are you working on now, and when can we expect a release? Is it more? Is it more right. tales? Morbid tales, which I said we finished that one about three years ago. We're finally getting it out there. Um, that's in the hands of the European distributor right now. So hopefully within a couple of months, they'll actually have the DVDs ready to go out. Right, and that's on eBay? Um, I'm just about... Um, it will be, yeah. Yeah, we'll have it on eBay. Maybe we'll even have our website back up by then. I don't know. We'll, we'll okay. see what exactly what's going to happen. But then we're also, we pretty much finished uh, shooting another movie called Septic, ah. which is going to be by far our most brutal movie ever. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we were getting banned in Germany once again, definitely when they confiscate this one. Um, <laughs> Is there anything that, like, say somebody bought your movie and they get caught with it? Do they get in trouble or can you get in trouble? Um, if the only place we have any problem is in Germany, 
And the only one is fetus. Blood pigs got confiscated, it passed. It got reviewed, it got passed. Well, bone sickness, I think, got confiscated, it got passed. Because they're monster movies, really. I mean, fetus yeah. is a way, but um, if so, if someone orders fetus from us, we tell the German customers, don't buy from us, buy from Black Lava, which is fine for some reason. But mm. if they did get caught with a copy coming from us, basically what they're they'll just lose they'll lose their order they might get fined i'm not quite sure but basically they just they'll lose the money of the, from the order nothing can happen to you then right they can't go after you say oh you're selling you're selling these movies to people and we already know it's banned they can't try and bring you to court can they as far as i know no <laughs> <laughs> i mean yeah. I, think, I think we have the ocean to protect us that's basically it. i don't think anyone in america any official in america is going to be like seriously we're going after this nobody filmmaker we've never heard of i don't think anyone <laughs> care so <laughs> yeah that's good <laughs> you might be better to say and stay anonymous for a while <laughs> yeah don't, don't hopefully you're, you don't become a breakout star anytime soon <laughs> i just won't plan on going to germany because I, if i go through customs my name's going to come up so i just i'll just avoid germany that's all <laughs> that's that's funny <laughs> and um I know that Rock and Shock, we mentioned that before, that was the main convention that I always saw you at. Do you think since they, Rock and Shock stopped doing business, if Chiller or some of the other ones pick up again, do you think you'll um, bring your merchandise there and start selling it? Unfortunately, with places like Chiller, we have to be invited because really? it's, just, it's too expensive. It's too expensive to get the table for the weekend and then the hotel for the weekend. It's just, we, if we just said the hell with it, let's just do it for fun. Yeah, we'll do that. But if we're going to make money, the hotel alone kills all your profits. Yeah. I mean, Rock and Shock, we had the hometown advantage. We're like, oh, we shot this hair. People are like, oh, no way. I want to see it just because of that. That wouldn't yeah. work in New Jersey. So, But last year, I did a couple of conventions. I did a convention in Pennsylvania. It was the first time I traveled that far for a convention. I was a guest there, so, and I did really well. I saw oh, the good. Of deals, so. Oh, were you if a speaker? People, what's that? I'm sorry, were you a speaker? Um, no, we, we had a table. Okay. We were given a table and they played Fetus. They're playing movies all day long and Fetus was one of them that they played. All right. Well, so basically Brian, I was, it was like being in the celebrity room for once. <laughs> I, I love your movies. Now after Morbid Tales is released, I know it's been done for years, do you have anything else that you're working on? Any ideas that you're writing down that's get, getting ready to become the next movie? I have a Lovecraft movie I want to make. All right. I, next thing I want to do is, next thing is definitely Lovecraftian. I want to do full-size Keiju style old one creatures. Mm -hmm. But the problem is I don't know if I'm going to be able to pull it off. <laughs> yeah. Because it's, what I want to do is so big. And I still want to do it the way we do it. I'm not, I don't want to go looking for money because then we'll have restrictions. They won't let us do, if, if we get money from somewhere, I know, they're not going to let us do what I want to do. So we're Even going to still do a try. Kickstarter? I don't want to do a Kickstarter because we did Indiegogo for the Cryptic Plasm DVDs and we added Morbid Tales on it. So I've owed people Morbid Tales DVDs for about two years now because we're still <laughs> trying to. So it was the worst mistake I've ever made in my life. <laughs> yeah. So I will never, I'll never do a fundraiser again because I have this weight on my shoulders knowing I still owe these people this DVD. And it's yeah. been. I hate it. I hate the feeling of it. So I don't want to do that again. We'll find you a way. We'll, you could do it. Sam Raimi. You could do what Sam Raimi and Bruce Campbell did when they were filming the first Evil Dead. They went door to door and said, "Hey, if you give us money for the movie, I'll make you an executive producer." <laughs> we've had we've had some luck with that. We've had some people saying, "Hey, I would love to help out." We're like, "All right, you know what? We we make a deal. We'll like we'll give we'll we'll call you an associate producer in the credits." Yeah. And they're like, "Okay, yeah, definitely." So we've had some people. We have some people on Septic um just helping out so well you know what i mean if you ever need help i love your movies i want to see you continue to make these movies so i'll be more than happy to help you however i can i'd love to see my name on the screen with Phoenix, <laughs> rich there <Sears. Definitely>. that'd be <laughs> great <laughs> well brian it's great talking to you and i cannot wait to see morbid tales and septic and all these other movies that you, know, you have coming out in the future and that wraps up the first edition of the Claws Corner on Zoom. I would like to thank my guest, director, musician, actor, writer, producer, and special effects aficionado, Brian Pollan. Thank you. I would also like to thank you, the listener, for tuning in. Enjoy your day, everyone. <laughs>